I was in a form of ecstasy and nirvana. I was celibate for seven years and I was just really committed to the universe and God and myself. Hyper reality simulations puts a person into a flow state, which is a hyper state of presence. The technology alone did this. Really helping makers and independent brands land their products onto retailer shelves, not the targets or anthropologies of the world, but the bread and butter across America and Europe, which are these small brick and mortar stores and don't believe anything people say about their dying. We're not. The gardening community is incredibly tight knit and we love to share success stories and failure stories. We love to show our scars. I'm Richard Gerhardt. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt. Boy, did we have amazing guests. You just heard a little bit from them. Stay tuned for the rest. That was the best one I think I've ever heard you do. <laughs> okay, well, we're off to a good start. I'm Richard Gerhardt, an intellectual property attorney. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt. I do the marketing for Gerhardt Law, an intellectual property firm that focuses on patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And welcome to Passage to Profit, the show that's all about innovation, small business, entrepreneurs, and the intellectual property that helps them flourish. Tonight, we have a very special guest, uh, Katie Chinakas, who has done so much in the entertainment field, it will amaze you. She's been an artist, actor, stand-up, comedian, producer, director, and the list goes on and on. So we're really looking forward to speaking with her. And we have three incredible presenters. So are you ready to jump off a cliff? <laughs> well, <laughs> Sometimes James, I feel like it. Yeah. James Jensen with Limitless Flight can help you do it in a very safe way. <laughs> it's really cool what he has. And then we have Flourish Market with Emily Gray. Are you ready to flourish? I will let her explain. And finally, Lynn Eichenbaum with Garden Sleeves. This is such a cool product and great for any gardener, anybody that works outside. Uh, perfect gift. I can't wait to hear from all of them. But before we do that, we have to go to a favorite segment of all of our listeners, IP in the news. And so what do we have on the table tonight for IP in the news? Um, we have... <laughs> We have laughter. That's always that's always good. So actually, that was fake laughter. We don't have anybody in the studio, but we are going to talk about the man who invented fake laughter. And I guess a long time ago, I, I, and I guess it really is a long time ago, back in the 50s and 60s, they used to tape television programs in New York in front of live audiences. And when the industry moved to Hollywood, it was decided that they weren't going to have live audiences anymore. And so um, this brilliant man, Charlie Douglas, came up with the laugh track machine, and they actually called it the laugh box. And he got a patent on it in 1990, uh, 1963, I'm sorry, but it included reels of laughter that he spliced out of shows. And then depending on what kind of uh, effect he wanted, he could press a button on the machine and it would play this tape and the laughter would occur and everybody would, would have the sound of laughter in the background. Well, so, I just used my phone for that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's, and, uh, and so in any case, it, it's interesting though how... Uh, television productions uh, frequently use laugh tracks to make their programs sound funnier. And I guess there's just something in the human brain that wants to laugh when they hear other people laughing. Well, sometimes I'm like, who is laughing at that? <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so without a laugh track, lots of times I make jokes and everybody's just sits there kind of stone faced. So I want to hear what the rest of the people here think about. This. I'm ready to go too. It's time for Richard's Roundtable. And uh, we'd love to hear from our guests about this, the patent, or really uh, any topics about intellectual property. So Katie, welcome to the show. And please uh, let us know what you think. Thank you so much for having me. Um, well, what I've seen over the past decade, um, when I see live audiences, and I'll see the, the person going like this to the people to like laugh, 
but then they'll also <laughs> have the the um the laugh pad too. So they'll they'll do both. Um, oh. and then they probably added it in the post. So um Carol Burnett and Lucille Ball. So I think Carol Burnett had live shows, right? And then did, would did Lucille Ball have um the live or was it uh the laugh pad? Do you I, know? I, I can't remember. Um but, uh, but there's a new movie coming out with about her. So maybe we'll find out. Yeah, maybe we'll find out. And um, but uh, there is definitely like, for example, if you watch Big Bang Theory, it's full of laugh track stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, and so the tradition continues, I guess. And I guess it adds to the entertainment value of the program. Right. Right. But it, I bet his patent has expired. So. Yeah, it's other expired. people are making the money. Yeah, oh, and wow. it was it's, uh, it's a big wooden mm-hmm. box about the size of a file cabinet, and they had all these tapes in there, and you'd push a button. So okay, so move on to James. Okay, cool. James, what are you? Oh, thoughts? I mean, I I think I think just looking at all of the stuff that I'm doing, I think it's brilliant that they did file a patent on that technology that would induce laughter in other people, and that's all based on probably like psychological triggers and things like that and i think that's a pretty cool thing and there's a lot of stuff that uh we have at our disposal now technology like this um where we can create experiences we can create scenarios that would allow a person to enjoy something or to have a heightened emotional state in a particular experience and i think that's just kind of cool and that's those were some of probably the founding things with media and entertainment was, Hey, we, we found that if we play this laugh track that everybody else will laugh. And I think that's, I, it's brilliant. Yeah. I, I think you know, there's something about being in an audience, right? It's different to watch a movie in a theater than it is to watch it on your television at home. Right. So this is the theory behind that, I guess. So Emily, what are your thoughts? Well, Katie, you made me think of going to live tapings of different shows I've been a part of over the years. And you got to really give it up for the hype men and women who get those real sounds of laughter or cheers going before the show. They're the real VIPs. But it also made me think of uh, when Dancing with the Stars came back. They're one of the first shows to come back during the pandemic. They had no audience. And I remember watching it just because I'm like, how are they going to do this? And the show opens with Tyra Banks walking forward with just tons of cheering coming from <laughs> these space and I remember feeling so uncomfortable and so cringy but also so happy that someone showed up trying to figure this out um because we still needed entertainment we still needed to hear um the fun and the cheers and the laughter um to really have the experience to kind of like build that bridge from what used to be to what is the now able to offer right yeah, that's a really interesting point and you sort of wonder you know, audiences can be unpredictable at times, right? So uh, if you're if you're if you're working on a project, and the writers think something is going to be good, but in in real life you don't have the opportunity to refine it. So if you're in the theater, for example, um, you get to test your the lines and you get to tune it because it's done over time. But you really don't have that luxury uh, if you're if you're taping uh, content. So um, I think this kind of evens out the playing field a little bit, right? So, uh, Lynn, what are your thoughts? Well, I started off my career before I became an inventor. I was actually a stage manager on The View and many other uh, ABC television shows. And we always had, uh, which I guess, you know, uh, not a lot of people know, but there's always an audience warm up person who goes in there and like, uh, you know, like Katie and Emily were saying, who hypes up the audience and gets them really excited and, you know, just gets the energy up. And that is so important because like you said, laughter is infectious. And if you're going in with the right mentality at the beginning, it's going to make the actors so much more uh, vivid and excited and the performance is going to be much better. And I know you guys were talking about Carol Burnett. I'm just telling you, you did not need a laugh track when Harvey Corman and Tim Conway were on. <laughs> <laughs> they were so darn funny when uh, you know, Tim Conway would be the old man and you know, kind of shuffling. I mean, that was so funny. So I think just sometimes you need it and sometimes you don't. <laughs> So Kenya, come on, what have you got to say about all this stuff? I agree with Lynn. I think like, especially when it came to Lucille Ball, like she was so sporadically funny. I can't imagine like having to use a laugh track with her. 
But what makes me really interested about this innovation is it really has set the benchmark for like how things move forward. So I think about the virtual reality space, a lot of things that are going on there in terms of like just creating these experiences, making them feel live for people. Like it's it's this invention plus all these extra moving parts. So just so interesting, like how things evolve over time and like where we are as a society. Right. And it, it, yes. it's it, it really is. Uh, it's 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 great because the point of entertainment, as opposed to maybe infotainment or some other uh, types of communication is for people to have a good time. Right. And so anything you can do to enhance that experience is positive for everybody. So I think uh, I think that's a really acute observation, Kenya, and I appreciate it. So um, we are at the end of the segment and we need to take a commercial break, but we'll be right back with more Passage to Profit right after this. Welcome back everybody to Passage to Profit. We just had a fascinating discussion about laugh tracks and uh, I don't remember having a discussion like that on this program. There's a first time for everything. I guess there is. You never know what you're going to get with Passage to Profit. But tonight, we do know what we're going to get because we have Katie Chinakas here. And she has just like been all over the place in media uh, and movies and directing and poetry and Bitcoin. And so how we're going to pull all this together is anybody's guess. But welcome to the show, Katie. Uh, so Thank happy you. to have you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> we'll so have to have multiple segments, right? <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's, it's, it's really amazing that you can do all of these things. So how did you get started in your career? Well, I mean, that's a big question. We could go so many different areas, but I guess, um, you know, growing up Greek Orthodox Christian gave me my family roots and everything starts with your roots. So my family immigrated from Europe and then I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. My parents grew up in Detroit, but then the riots were happening and they moved out of Detroit. And, you know, I was grown up into a society where, you know, every, everyone has their circumstances. And I just felt like a bird in a cage having to break out. And I was an empath and the HSP, a highly sensitive person. And I didn't know the language of empath or HSP when I was a child, but I felt a lot like a baby screaming and you just don't have the language, right. Until you hear a song or it's like, we all feel the same thing and we're connected. So I had these emotions and I felt things more than other people. And I would observe, and I was just an observer and a great actor is a great observer, same thing for an artist. So I would observe all these things and I felt so much and I didn't have the language for it. And so I knew I had to to get out of where I wanted to live and make other people feel good. I wanted to make other people laugh. So I, I just need to ask you a question. You were talking sure. about how being an actor requires great observance. What are you looking at? What, did, what are the things that you're observing? Not only am I observing, for example, you know, blue suit, floral scarf, just um, the physicalities of how one is moving, if how the nose is, if someone's listening, if they're tuned in, if they're shaking their head, yes, if they're looking, if they're looking away, if they're actually listening, because being an actor, it's, it's one thing is, is saying, 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 and the other side, a lot of times when casting directors and directors are looking on, on the tapes, when the other person's lines come, they're like a deer in headlights because there's no life going on because they're thinking about what doesn't exist the future. They're thinking about, you know, their next lines. So they're not actually in the moment of being here right now. And also it's the subtle energies of the silence and the intelligence of the silence that's unspoken is, is what I really attune to because I use my body intelligence. I feel the most. Wow. That's amazing. And I agree with you. I think there's a lot to be said for good pausing, right? And, you know, because it, creating that silence helps create attention and it allows people to catch up with you or get you. And so those are, 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 are really magnificent points. So what was your first, what was your first sort of professional role? Mm, my first role was amazing CSI New York with Gary Sinise. And, um, he wow. was, he, I know he was great. And then, um, the, um, 
the Greek actor who's, you know, who's on the show as well. They go to my church, actually, St. Sophia's. <laughs> but um, it was really cool working with um, Gary Sinise because I was on set working with him and in between takes, because you do like the wides, the mediums, the close-ups, the reversals. And we're so like face-to-face -face for like 14 hours, six hours, working a long time together. And he was just like, you're a very soulful actor. And I just remembered him saying that. And I just, I've had that nugget with me for, you know, since 2005. So, you know, since, since that, it's just remembering because there's different kinds of actors, right? And he was just like, you're a very soulful actor. So it really touched my heart. And I have, you know, so that was, that was pretty amazing working with him and the whole crew on CSI New York. So Katie, uh, there are so many things we can talk about, but you have been yeah. an artist, actor, stand-up comedian, producer, director, musician, voiceover artist, industry coach, spoken word poetry artist, podcaster, published author, author, NFT artist. What was your favorite thing to do? Mm, I think my favorite thing out of everything, I love poetry. I love poetry. I love language. I like the, the sound, the vibration, the intentionality of our words, like what we, what comes up for us, what we send to other human beings. You know, it's such an important responsibility, us as humans of what we say, how we say it, and how it affects and make an impact on others. So that really moves and moves me a lot. But of course, I have to say one other thing, which is painting, because it's, I love all the different colors. And, you know, there's that, there's that whole language of, you know, being an artist and painting too. So I want to put you on the spot a little bit. Could you recite a short poem of yours for our audience? Oh, okay. Um, they're pretty long, but um, let's see here. Here's one. Here's one I got because, you know, I take poetry and I put in some music. So it goes hmm. pure lights. What I radiate, you know how I gravitate higher powers on collaborate. So we meditate going nonstop. Then repeat the mantra. I don't see the lower levels. All my homies on top. Yeah. Higher forms going where the light is warm. What you fighting for? There's a fire that's inside us pure. Try igniting yours. You can be your own prophecy. Everything in harmony. This is our philosophy. Yeah. What? That was totally <laughs> All right. Cool. <laughs> so Kenya, I'm sure you've got something to say here. Well, Katie's got bars, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you. So, I, what was your, what would you say is you would been your hardest scene to act out? Mm, mm, mm. You know, a scene that was really difficult, and it was weird because it wasn't a movie or a TV show. Samuel Bear, he did The Cranberries, Nirvana, Team Spirit. He was like the biggest music video director and he went on to feature films. But he directed me in Pink's Who Knew Music Video. And it's like, whoa, like has pff, insane. Like <laughs> um, he, the way he directed me though, you know, it was just like very specific and intricate of, you know, cause I was dealing with a boyfriend who was a heroin addict and he loved me, but he just loved the drugs more. And I, I had to make the choice to leave him. And that was very, very, very fucking, excuse me. It was very difficult to do um, in the scene and the character, you know, when I was working on that project with Samuel Bear, that was, it was pretty difficult. And, but he gave a lot of range for me to, you know, and we found it together, but it, it took a lot because it's pink story and it's based off a true story of pink. So I wanted to be authentic to her, you know, and, and get the, the beats right and the emotions right and, and everything to be, to tell that story for another artist who I greatly admire. Wow, it, it, it's it's to be true to somebody who's living right and in mm. the public. Um, that's that's a that's a tough job, right? Because uh, especially with Pink, because she's got you know so many different. Uh, it's, it's got so much appeal. Um, you were talking about being an NFT artist, and mm. that's kind of like a new thing. I'm not sure our audience is really familiar with the whole NFT sure. piece. And we were wondering if you could kind of explain that and then sure. how the NFT piece is, is, is working. Okay. It, it's, it's a lot to unpack, but we'll try to keep it very simple and basic. But um, I've been in the space since 2018 with NFTs. It was very, very cool. I was brought in early. I DJ. And so I was DJing these house parties in Hollywood Hills. I was DJing these dope parties downtown. All these blockchains were raising all these funds. People were flying in for, from everywhere. They were flying me to New York. I was 
so, DJing. So, and, so blockchain is like this new technology out yeah, there. Yeah. And, and it's kind it, of, yeah. It's kind of like in the back, in the, in the gold rush, people went to California to actually mine and dig for gold underground physical. And now we're in an evolved emotional state and process in life where people are mining digitally with your brains and with technology, instead of physically mining, people are doing it through the blockchain, um, you know, and, and it that way. And, and, and the blockchain is really a way of just like verifying uh, the identity on a very detailed level of people or objects or currency or values. And it's, it's going to become more and more uh, prevalent, but it's still new in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of ways. A lot of people don't know about it. The, the, I'm, I've been in the community for a while, so it's like it's, I hear it every single day. So I, I um, employ others to um, research, check out Gary V, like find out like all the NFT artists, like, you know, they're all following me on Instagram. I'm following them. Um, just like get involved, like just Google NFTs, look at the conference, look at the, like my friend JR, um, Gabe Weiss, like look at the artists who are, you know, making it happen, who are on the forefront. You can go to OpenSea, you can see who, who are on the front page, you can learn about it. And, and for me, I personally like Matic. It's a certain, um, you know, it's environmentally friendly, M-A-T-I-C. So there's different ones. So, I mean, there's so many of them. So I, I best, the best thing to do is just get involved and um, learn about it because it's, it's already happening. So um, it's still very early for people to get involved and artists want other artists to get involved. Like during the pandemic, I was on Clubhouse nonstop and everyone's just helping one another and pe people don't want to keep people out and not give them information. We want to give you information. We want to help you because we can decentralize and you know, take our economy to new heights and embrace one another for what we really want, you know, equality, health, prosperity, for a better uh, lifestyle for not only us, but you know, for everyone, you know, living here on the planet, like dismantle the stuff that's not serving us, that's not good for us. So in short, I would just like to say, like, you know, dragma in Greek, in Greece, like the, the currency is dragma. It, it's obsolete. It went obsolete like like 2003 or something. But mm -hmm. For, and they went and they went into the EU. They used the euros. That's in my lifetime. We had the dragmas that went obsolete, right? So there are currencies in the, the franc. There's currencies that have gone obsolete while we're here. It's the same thing with like the dollar bill, like right. like us shifting to a new dimension of new currency. So the thing, the reason why people are boggling their heads around it, is because we're so programmed and conditioned to know that's red. Oh, that must be red. How can I think about anything else, but that heart being red, because I see it as red. So it's deprogramming what we've been programmed like a computer mm. and being open to people who are very educated, who've done the research, who know the technology. What are NFTs uh, for artists? Sure. Uh, NFTs are non-fungible tokens. It's a way for an artist in any medium they are as artists through a, a photo, a music video, anything you can think of, anything can be art, you can put it on the blockchain. And it's really cool because there's programs out there where you have no gas fees. So instead of it being a cost overhead for you as a business person, the buyer actually pays those gas fees and you just get the money in addition to the percent. And every time it sells and resells, you get a percent of that forever for eternity not just a one-off which happens when you sell art sometimes you only get the initial commission but every time it sells and resells you get that commission so it's really cool so it's sort of like there's a, a computer piece that follows the ownership of the art around and every time that computer piece changes the artist gets paid again is that kind of a simple way to say it sure yeah technology contracts yeah. Mm -hmm. okay yeah. yeah okay so can I ask a question about something a little bit different? Of course. And, and so you have a podcast. I didn't want to ask you about your podcast called She's All Over the Place. So can you tell us a little bit what you talk about on your podcast? Sure. My podcast, She's All Over the Place, is all about arts and business and entertainment with ethics, morals, and values. And we have three seasons up right now. And the fourth season is in January. And it's all about women empowerment and divine femininity, but not only divine femininity in quote unquote females, but divine femininity in all genders. So we're going to explore those kind of things and break down societal norms and stigmas. 
That sounds, uh, that sounds, that sounds great. And um, what are some of the, I mean, do you have some of the topics lined up? Can you give us a little bit more detail about that? Oh, sure. I mean, um, I have an art advisor on. She's amazing. Um, I have a doctor, um, Dr. Dittman on, um, who deals with prenatal um, specifically. And, um, you know, we're going to, I have a 15 year old girl on and I want to talk about, you know, things about what she knows and things that like, you know, I wasn't told and things were not told and things even as adults were still not told. And, you know, breaking down and actually communicating certain things that we, we should know so we can make better choices about intimacy and our boundaries with ourselves and for other people. Well, that's, that's great. You also have a book, A Lover's Fairy Tale. What do you talk about in that? Sure. Um, I have thousands of poems and I traveled the world and I was in a form of ecstasy and nirvana. I was celibate for seven years and I was just really committed to the universe and God and myself. And I really wanted to explore why I was here as a human, this gift that was given to me before I could gift myself to another human being. So I went around the world and I was just in ecstasy and nirvana looking at these waterfalls and, you know, animals and culture and food and like language and these people and Bermuda and Dominican Republic and just all these wonderful places. And I was just writing about a lover's fairy tale of the universe of life and what nature has given gifted us, you know, (laughs) and there's no price tag on that. And so I took 11 pieces and I put it into the poetry book. Excellent. Kenya, do you have anything to say? Oh, I love that you did that. Right. And I think it's the the guidebook to like all young women and what they should do before they put themselves in any type of permanent situation. Exactly. Exactly. For sure. One thousand percent. What you just said, it's because when I was a little being the observer, I said when I was younger, I saw all the girls, all the boys you know, all the things that have crying and like some boys would be like, oh, you, you can't wear your skirt needs to be down to your knee or people would be like, oh, button your thing. And uh, people would be sobbing, crying. It's like, I'm not going to be crying over anybody. And I'm not going to be telling anyone telling me what to do. And I didn't want all the girl, all the girls like, and I'm like, I didn't, I didn't want, I didn't feed into any of that crap. I'm like, I don't want any of that. I want to be very clear and know, know thyself, right? Like get to know self and my purpose before and become an oak tree before I can gift myself to someone else. I, I need to enjoy, receive the gift, right? And we amen. can do that at any age. Yeah. Uh, what'd you say? I was just saying, amen, sister. Yay. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, you know, one thing Richard and I have always brought up the show is kind of for innovation, that you're very innovative and entrepreneurs, but really some of the most important work you can do in your life is on yourself, right? And it to really be successful, you really need to get some of these pieces of your psyche and yourself nailed down, right? What you just said, the psyche, 1000%. It's so deep rooted in there. You know, no matter like anything you say or I say, I I could never, ever fully express in words what is really going on, but there's a transfer and energy in a place that we can only go to like the deepest in the ocean. Right. And it's, it's pure bliss. Like I always say, like lean into the sorrow. Like when I cry, I love crying. It feels so good to cry. And I'm like, yo cry. And some people are like, oh, you're crying too much. Or you're crying. It's like, it just shows like where they are, you know, and it's, it shows that where they are, not, not who I am, because I'm like, it's, it's, I, I, I like to cry. It's, it's okay. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah, I mean, having, having, having real uh, emotional experiences, I think really enhances a person's, a person's life and also finding time to reflect quietly uh, and contemplate what's going on is also, uh, for me personally, uh, very important. Uh, Elizabeth and I just recently took a trip to Sedona where, in, in Arizona, it has some beautiful uh, rock formations. It's very close to the Grand Canyon. And it was really spiritual to be there and to be uh, a- around the nature and to see what has been created it's just such a unique uh unique environment and i i remember spending time by a river and really just sort of just sitting and enjoying the sounds of the the river 
It was a beautiful sunny day. It was fall, and uh, having have, taking the time to enjoy those kinds of things is is fundamental to be to being a person. I think, and to your point about finding yourself, our daughter uh, is doing just that. She's going to be a traveling nurse, and she's traveling around, and and, and I, she's going to hike the Appalachian and, and Trail by hike, herself. And she's going to hike the Appalachian Trail, and she's very independent. And I think that she's taking the time to find herself before getting involved in a relationship. So I, I think that's really good advice uh, uh, for, for, for men and for women, right? So. Yeah, and also one other thing, it's like, I was taught, I mean, I'm sure we're all taught things, but by certain individuals, I was taught, you know, not to show those emotions. So I, I've been very good at putting a public persona up and being able to compartmentalize feelings and put them into the corner you know, which is great for like show business when you have to show up to a set for 200 and 300 people. I know how to stuff those away. And if you need to do it temporary, but you can't ignore it. It's good to like, let those things come out. But I, I was taught at a very young age, like, you know, um, not to show those emotions. So I think that's why it's maybe one of my purposes and callings to be able to roar and, and be like, I'm going to let it all out, you know, and like, I'm going to let everyone else know it's okay. Let it out. Like, let it out. <laughs> but that moment of silence is so beautiful. I love Sedona, the vortexes. There's so many vortexes. Oh, right. mm -hmm. They say Sedona is the, um, the spiritual playground for like, when people go to Disneyland, it's, it's for like the spiritual playground for adults. <laughs> well, it kind of freaked me out a little bit because I saw faces everywhere in the rocks. Mm like everywhere <laughs> it's really strange that, that, wow. that, could have, that could have been the wine but we won't <laughs> we, won't, we don't need to take that at too sunrise, much sunrise i was not drinking at sunrise <laughs> oh we weren't oh. <laughs> anyway anyway uh, with that with that note with that note uh katie it's just been amazing to have you on the show and you are such a high level thinker and it's no wonder that you can handle so many different projects at one time. It doesn't surprise me one bit. You're a special talent. And I hope you'll stick around uh, yeah. for a few more minutes so we can uh, enjoy your company with our other presenters. In the yeah, meantime, Thank you. we need to go to a commercial break. This is Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back, everybody. Passage to Profit. We're having a great episode today. And uh, it's time for a power move. So Kenya, who is on the chopping block today? <laughs> so for power move, we're going to be talking about DJ Khaled. If you don't know who he is and you've been under a rock, he's a Grammy award-winning rapper. He's a producer and he's teamed up with the Reef Technologies to create another wing. I don't know if you heard his phrase, another one. Well, he's created another wing, which is going to offer ready to order wings via jet ski. And he modeled what? this. Yeah, he modeled this after uh, the ghost kitchen concept that took off during the pandemic. So if you're not familiar with the ghost kitchen, it's basically a delivery only restaurant model that exploded during quarantine. And he's launched with, uh, with 150 kitchens in five countries. Right. And you can get ready to order chicken wings via jet ski right to your dock. So DJ Khaled is so doing just, another thing. I <laughs> I, I'm, I love the idea, but isn't the market for that kind of limited to people who live close to water? Well, yeah, I think that's that's the reason, right? So he's focusing on those 150 countries in those markets that have people who have access to water who can get that typical uh, delivery service. I mean, it may not be big here if you don't live by a dock, but there are other markets where he can super serve and really dominate. So I thought that was a good way to think outside of typically what's been being done. Right. Well, how cool it would be to get your food by jet ski. And then maybe if you gave the 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 gal or the guy an extra 40 bucks, they'd take you for a ride or something like that. Ew. That just sounds like awesome to me. So no, with those wings, I'd probably be eating. I'd be like, I gotta eat. <laughs> eating and jet skiing at the same time. <laughs> right. I do have a short wing story. Oh, you have a short wing story? It's a short wing story. So I remember I was in South Africa with 50 in G unit and I was opening up for them in front of like 18,000 people in like Europe and South Africa and Patrice, he's the first um, African-American um, 
billionaire in Africa. And he made, he was a law, he was in law and then he bought his first gold mine and he's Patrice now. And he, he did some partnerships with 50, but I was touring open up for 50 and Patrice in Cape town had this huge party for us. It was amazing. Like creme de la creme of everyone in like Cape town was at the house. And we like went through all these areas and there was just this massive like King's table waiting for us. And yo, there was just like, Oh, like a, a, platter of wings and like 50 just sat down and yo he was eating like 30 wings in a row he was just eating <laughs> wing after wing so i yo, believe it, it oh it was so <laughs> fun it was so fun well, you gotta, we ought to hook these two guys up and, and you know <laughs> i'm sure they probably already talked about it I'm sure they know each other. <laughs> well so fireside there you go chicken wings so yes yeah, so fireside so Fireside is my startup. It's a video directory of small businesses. And I spent quarantine video, uh, interviewing people on Zoom. And right now I'm working on the back end of it. So I just joined a peer advisory board because it's kind of like coaching, except you meet once a month with other business owners that are in the same spot you are. And everybody holds each other accountable. And there are higher level coaches that you work with. But I kind of stalled because of a number of different reasons i've been pretty busy with the law firm and other things too but yeah so she's burning the candle at both ends that's for sure and the holidays are coming up but i'm starting it next month so i'm pretty excited about this i think everybody needs a coach and i just hadn't had one yet and i think this i try to coach her she doesn't listen to me <laughs> 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 so so hey well now, we, we coach listen, each other i, I listen she gives to you me more business advice than vice versa so he came up with a really good idea while we we're traveling so guess who gets to write the patent application so they'll throw that in my lap too but anyway with all this other stuff going on i do need somebody that's going to hold me accountable and put my feet to the fire and so i'm joining this business advisory peer group or whatever they call it so that's pretty exciting for me because I haven't done that before and I really do need a business coach. So yeah, we and, well, we, we all benefit from coaches. I've certainly had my share and it's, it's a, uh, it's a lot of way, a good way to get a lot of different perspectives on what you're doing. That's for sure. So now, now I am ready to introduce our first presenter, non-guest presenter. So are you ready to take a leap, but a safe leap? <laughs> So James Jensen with Limitless Flight. This is just so cool. I can hardly wait to do this. Please, James, tell us all about it. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited to be here. Jump is uh, brought to you by Limitless Flight, and it is a, a wingsuit flying experience. I like to ask people if they've ever had a dream of flying. And of course, everybody says absolutely. And then they explain this amazing experience that they have in their dream of flight. Um, imagine being able to fulfill that like right now and you know what would it take for you to do this is it even possible for you to do this and we really unavailable for the majority of people on the planet there's probably 800 to a thousand people a year that and it fluctuates between that because it's extremely dangerous um, but and, and uh, how many people actually survive that's the other <laughs> follow-up question there what was that sorry and how many people actually survive of those 800 to 1,000 that do the jumping? That's why I'm saying is the number fluctuates every year. It doesn't go up. <laughs> it fluctuates, which is, which is kind of sad. You know, my friend, uh, Marshall Miller, he's, uh, you know, he's done over 10,000 jumps. He's also helping on this project to make sure that it's authentic as possible. But jump, jump makes it possible. We, I did this in my last venture with The Void. It was a walking virtual reality simulation. We had several locations worldwide. And we had a partnership with Disney and Sony. And it was a virtual hyper-reality simulation you walk around in. And we wanted to take this, uh, I wanted to take this the next step and really emphasize what this means. And we looked at what are the most impactful experiences that you can have? And I love the conversation we had earlier, the conversation I was listening to about experiences and what creates you. And if you think about who you are this very moment, you're the equivalent of the experiences you've had to date. And so what if in virtual and hyper reality simulations, you could curate an experience that gave you a different perspective when you were younger, and you knew that it would give you that different perspective because of the data and analytics that we correct that we collected through that. So if you look at what jump is, it is absolutely an amazing flying experience where you get to, ex you get to experience 
something that's not obtainable, cost you thousands of dollars and you have to risk your life to jump off of a cliff if you survive. So um, I, that can, experience can I could be just, so meaningful. Can I just interrupt? So you picked the, um, the flying squirrel model, basically, you know, the jumpsuit jumping off the thing. You did that because that was the most extreme experience that you could think of, right? And so, and, and, and that's why you, you, you picked that. It's in virtual reality, kind of, right? So, right, it's in virtual reality yes. that you were looking for the max experience that you could find for somebody, right? Absolutely. And one of the reasons why I chose that is when I found, when I created the void, I was doing that for entertainment's sake alone. Uh, it was amazing. You could go in and fight Darth Vader in Star Wars, it was awesome. But what I found, what, which was a byproduct, was what I actually found was hyper reality simulations puts a person into a flow state which is a hyper state of presence the technology alone did this and people would come out with the experience almost reborn or everything was new again i had adults go in one side and 17 16 year old kids came out the other side and everything was new and i was like what is going on inside of this this is a place on the planet that we have now in technology where we have a person's 100 percent attention we have them in flow state and we can teach them things at a very deep level and through an experience uh, where I would say you step up to the edge and you're faced with a fear barrier and you have the opportunity to jump past that fear barrier and land and celebrate that you did something life-threatening and you succeeded, you could say that you could compare that to a lot of different things in the person's life. Um, that's what I'm really excited about with what this technology could bring to the world. So I just want to clarify for our listeners, because I did go on your website and looked at it. It looked very cool. You put on this outfit and you do a jump, but you really, you're only two feet off the ground or something, right? Yes, you are. It's, you put on a real wingsuit. It's made by the same company, Squirrel, that makes real wingsuits. And um, you step up to the edge and it's the ultimate trust fall. You don't know that you are going to be suspended or what what happens inside of the experience all that is kind of an illusion but you step up to the edge and you have to jump off and you fall and you eventually start flying and then you figure out that you have control of this flight and you can fly anywhere you want and then at the end you pull your parachute and you land in safety all but all in the real world if everything tragically went wrong you would probably fall a foot and a half and bruise your knee but there's no real risk that's the <laughs> incredible thing is in this experience, you can step up to the edge of what looks like death and say to yourself, all of the, ex all of the fear that I'm experiencing is completely 100% artificial and I can work past that. Ultimate mind game. I, I will say definitely, but the experience always turns out well. So no matter how always. inexperienced, <laughs> okay, you're, you, yeah, you I don't mean, have the, the virtual, the virtual crash into the mountain uh, simulation yeah. part, right? We don't, okay. you, you, we can help, we can stop you from doing that. We can do, since we're in a virtual world, we can manipulate physics, we can put on a training wheel so you don't, uh, you know, everybody has a great experience the first time. So it, it just boggles the mind. What if we were able to capture every single difficult experience and put it in a virtual reality test like this? It just, yeah. You just wonder, you know, if, if you had, if you were to put men and women's stuff and then diff, people of different races and you were able to like, create That's this empathy what what would what how how different would the world be if we could do that you know? it's going to be amazing you know from my perspective this is the new education system it's experiential learning through hyper reality simulations and it's in a way a little bit of like exposure therapy but what is the new education system how do you create creators and how do you create people that can have critical thinking and bring new concepts into reality it's there's a big shift that's happening in education. And this is, I, I, from my perspective, this is the future. I like to use a, uh, a quote from the matrix where Neo touches the back of the couch and uh, Morpheus is on the other side and he says, is this real? And Morpheus is like, well, what is real? If real is what you can see or hear or feel, then real is just electrical impulses in your brain. I've never wingsuit jumped in my life. I've never even parachuted out of an airplane but i have a memory of wingsuit and base jumping even though i've never done it before because of the simulation that i created that's amazing it just goes to show you how much your mind controls everything so do you see this going like where a man could 
experience pregnancy with it <laughs> <laughs> or child I don't know about reducing that kind of pain. <laughs> but, wouldn't that uh, be awesome I, yeah so, i don't know <laughs> so, uh, well i mean that, that's that but it is interesting there are so many possibilities and even right. just simpler experiences like you yeah, know they don't they don't need to be complex yeah. um you know one of the things that separates normal you know performing people uh to you know advanced performance is the fear barrier the fear of failing mm -hmm. the fear of not you know of, of not achieving what you're going to do and so people just don't do it they they literally don't try and so you know giving them an experience to allow them to go through that process and see success i think i mean the hypothesis is you could um you could create some great experiences for people they could learn faster um so it could it, i mean we're starting a foundation of things with the technology that i think is going to go throughout the next few years and we'll really discover what the possibilities are so elizabeth is nudging me here saying katie's probably bursting at the seams to contribute here so <laughs> i was trying to hold back honestly I was like, i want to say things well, i was just wondering so when when can we show up and have the experience yeah me too So we are thank you um we have two locations utah our corporate office here is being built out right now we we're hoping to get it done this year but we've seen delays on covid and shipping and stuff and so we're a few months behind uh but our location here in utah will be open at the first of the year we're going to host a few people out here to start doing this um and then american dream in new jersey which will have six jump bays this is also a shared experience so you don't do it by yourself you can be there with other people and see them and talk to them and jump with them and race or whatever you want to do and you can say well, holy cow, cow. <laughs> yeah, well let me know i'll show up with some people think about me let's do it and yeah and then also what elizabeth was saying earlier about getting in how we were talking about like she was saying the psyche you know and and going to that place to get past and, and your daughter going on the trails and going on an adventure. I remember being in Grand Canyon and there was this like hike and it was 110, 120 degrees weather. And, and you know, my friend nudged me to go past my own limits. And afterwards I was like invigorated. I grew and, and being a cross country runner with short term, medium term, long term goals, I learned as an athletic mentality to not li like I listen to my emotions, but I'm going to do it anyway. Right. We go past the emotions. So what you're saying, you know, I think just another language is, is, is getting past our own emotions, you know, cause so many people think our emotions are us. Right. And sometimes we don't know how to break down and decipher if we should do it or not do it. Cause we're feared that we shouldn't do it. Cause these emotions are holding us back, but that's when we have to like check in with self to know like, Oh, this is fire. I shouldn't really go there. Or actually I'm feeling this thing, but I'm going to get up and do it anyway, you know, so to show up and make the commitment just to do it is, is more than half the battle for sounds like the experience yeah. that you're creating. So I'm excited to try it out and tell yeah, everyone yeah. about it. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. yeah thank Kenya, you so you're... much. I mean, it's just a, it's a new, it's, a, you know, this is all groundbreaking technology and it's really going to unlock some potential for people. Awesome. Kenya, what are your thoughts here? I, I love it. I think it sounds very therapeutic. Um, I'm just curious, how long is the simulation? Like how, what is, how long is the experience? Uh, that's a good question. So we have paired it really tightly to real physics right now. So a normal wingsuit jump is like 30 to 60 seconds long, but since we are in a virtual simulation, we can distort physics. And so we can make it a lot longer. We can make it five minutes, but I think more importantly, it's about doing from what I'm seeing, it's more importantly about doing m multiple jumps and like one long flight. So it could be upwards of five minutes actually in the simulator, but our full experience, you know, suit up, suit down and tutorials and all that stuff is around 45 minutes when you come to the location. That's I would so imagine funny. five minutes is enough, you know? I, 60 seconds intense. is enough. <laughs> Most people, they take the helmet off. They haven't, you know, their eyes are a little bloodshot because I don't think they close their eyes, but. Uh, yeah. I can hardly wait to try this. I This is just amazing. And I do think that, it's going to be very therapeutic. And I, and I do think it's a new way of learning, like really learning bravery and what you're capable of without the mind blocks that we all have. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, the, for, the limiting for, beliefs are real. 
And, and, and if somebody could create like a virtual cheeseburger eating machine, I would be <laughs> totally down for that. So <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, you could eat without the calories. You, you can eat without the calories. <laughs> you're, you're, there you you're go. Experiencing eating, I mean, <laughs> but you're still hungry. <laughs> anyway, so anyway. this is so cool. I can't even believe this is happening, but unfortunately we can't talk about it anymore because we have to move on. But where can people find you uh, when it's ready and they want to go sign up? Yeah, you can follow us. Uh, it's jump at Limitless Flight on most of the uh, social channels. And then you can go to limitlessflight.com and you can see, uh, you know, the latest there, sign up for our newsletter. Uh, and then just follow us on Instagram. We have a lot of live feed stuff coming for uh, uh, Twitter and all of those channels. And so um yeah stay tuned it's it's all coming here it's gonna be location based so uh we're gonna be spreading out locations worldwide uh next year and following years and and you'll see us soon well, we can't wait. thank you james jensen so listeners you are listening to passage to profit where we truly do bring you the latest in innovation i would say that's <laughs> pretty cutting edge today. Yeah. so we are on wr 710 and we will be right back well, welcome back, listeners. You are listening to Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, Passage to Profit on WOR710. If you missed the beginning of our show and you want to hear some of the most innovative things going on in the world right now, you need to go back and listen to our podcast, which will be out tomorrow on all the major podcast platforms and like us on our podcast and go to our YouTube channel and you can see what everybody looks like. It's kind of fun. But right now we are going to usually have... you say we're all good looking is what you well, say. Well, we are. Well, they are. I mean, they're good looking. We always get good looking people on this show. I don't know. I'm just not going to throw myself. at us. That's all. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're, fla- we're flawless. She's right. We're flawless over here. Boss it up on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank goodness for some of these filters on these recording <laughs> devices now. <laughs> anyway, um, but next up is Emily Gray. She has emilygrayco.com. She has Flourish Market. She's a small business coach. She's really approaching things in a very innovative new way. So I'll let her explain. Welcome, Emily. Thank you for having me. What a crew here. So fun to be in everyone's company. We're having such a good time. Uh, So yes, uh, I'm the founder and owner of the Flourish Market, which was my first entrepreneurial baby. Uh, We just celebrated our six-year anniversary, and the Flourish Market is a women's and gifts boutique um, based in downtown Raleigh, North Carolina, but we do a ton of online business. So we've really grown our e-commerce over the past three years. Um, I'm an ex-investment banker, so I did a lot of back office support around communications and change management, and it was during my time in corporate that I launched um, kind of uh, this behind the scenes service to nonprofits and social enterprises, doing the skill set I had honed in corporate of like helping people um, win people over to new ideas. And so serve behind the scenes with nonprofits and social enterprises, saw really cool small brands all over the world and right here in the US doing really neat things, but they were the best kept secret. They weren't on retail shelves. Um, People, you know, they couldn't compete with SEO. And so at the age of 30, I quit my corporate job and launched a fashion truck. I had spent $8,000. I exchanged $8,000 of cash in a sketchy bank parking lot and bought an old uniform delivery truck. And that was July of 2015 and October 2015 launched um, what is now my brick and mortar store. But for the first year, I was a fashion truck. I wanted to be very risk averse. And We're in a 3,500 square foot facility today. We do about half of our sales online. Um, Within the first three years of doing business, we grew to over a million in sales um, just based on the principle that people actually wanted to use their purchasing power for good. They wanted to know about these small brands. Uh, They wanted to know about the um, brand in Ethiopia, which their bags are made by women who are crushing the stigma of HIV and AIDS um, in their small communities. They wanted to support um, women walking through um, survival from abuse, going through addiction um, programs right in Nashville, Tennessee. And it was cool to see people um, kind of it click with them of, oh, someone actually makes my products, who's making them, and can I steward my money in a way that makes a positive impact? 
Um, so yeah, that's how, that's how it all started. Uh, today you mentioned my website, emilygrayco.com. So I actually spent the last two years, um, about 60% of my time in my days coaching these small brands, these small business owners, bringing them a retail perspective. So really helping makers and independent brands land their products onto retailer shelves, not the targets or anthropologies of the world, but the bread and butter across America and Europe, which are these small brick and mortar stores and don't believe anything people say about they're dying. We're not. Uh, so I, I love, love, love um, innovation, which I know is what this podcast is all about. And I don't want people to be the best kept seekers. I want to help them bring it to market. Well, I love it. You know what? One of my favorite things on vacation is to go into stores just like yours. Like I don't right. want to go, right? I don't want to go into a Target when I'm visiting another city, right? I want to find something new and different. That's so cool. Right. Well, and Elizabeth, we need to sync up because I leave for Sedona on Thanksgiving Day. So I want to know the stores <laughs> you went to and the restaurants and everything. Katie, I know you've been there as well. Send me your recos. <laughs> Well, oh, we yeah, can send you just... some places not to go. That's <laughs> I'll take those two. <laughs> yeah, there's this just it's just this one street. It's the main drag, and oh, it's you're gonna be in heaven. I'm excited. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll and, tell you. And sign up for a UFO sightseeing tour, but make sure you get the right company. So All right. yeah, get an established about this. I love, I love good recommendations. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I got a trip advisor. <laughs> getting back to what, you, um, you know, I, first of all, I think this is wonderful because you found a way to connect people in a way that haven't connected before for reasons that they should connect. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, what things you believe in and want to support is personal to each person. But there are other people out there that yes. are working to 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 contribute to to make products, jewelry, what a, a, a handbags and um, and 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 they need they need support, but they create wonderful things. And I just think it's amazing that you've been able to bring all of that together. And it's what Elizabeth, you said earlier that everyone needs a coach. I also believe everyone needs a community. I love that you've joined this community of business leaders. And I've really modeled um, what I do here in Raleigh through my business. And then what I do through the wholesale way, which is my coaching program for makers and brand owners from what I've seen work abroad. You know, I think people walk into my store and their first reaction might be, oh, I'm going to help poor people. I mean, I'll just put words to that. There is such a complex um, that we've learned, you know, that we know everything. Um, other people who might be at different socioeconomic levels than us, um, maybe know less, and that's actually not true. And so as I've traveled the world, traveled in America and and sat with these local leaders who've usually been impacted by the same thing the people that make the goods of their brand have been impacted by. It's been interesting to hear to hear part of their kind of, and, and James, you were talking about this too, but getting past that fear and part of their healing journey has been being in community with people who get it, who've walked similar paths and um, just how much that's grown them as people. And then they've launched these incredible businesses together. And so I find that entrepreneurship can be lonely, especially entrepreneurs in the ethical social enterprise space. Um, it's, it's, um, Yes, we're seeing it in the trend reports. I'm a big economic stork, having investment banking as my background. I, I love it. I dork out over trends. And so it's been exciting, especially as the pandemic hit, to see that consumers are actually being more mindful of their purchases. And yet these founders, these innovators, these folks like really in the trenches, they feel very lonely. And so that I really wanted to round everyone up that's doing all these good things, be able to get them to see that they're not alone in their struggles and they're very unique um, principles they're sticking to. For example, James, you mentioned your stuff stuck on a ship. So, you know, when they don't have access to things that are ethically made to go into their products, what do you do, right? What do you do? Do you buy something that's unethically made or not? And just bringing those discussions together, having that support system. And really there is, I searched the internet far and wide and there's such limited information for founders of these independent brands on how to get their, their things onto retailers like shelves. There's, it's, there's basically it is, none. And so very, it's very true. Very it's been, yeah, it's just such a niche, right? And so there's people that will tell you how to land in the targets, how to land, how to do Amazon, how to land in these huge retailers. But at the end of the day, brick and mortar stores, they're um, less risk averse. 
You don't have to like sometimes, sometimes makers have to put their brand at risk to go all in on a PO from a big brand and then it gets dropped for whatever reason. And so I really specialize in working with those folks to help them scale at a smaller, at, at a more like structured rate um, if they are more risk averse uh, like me. Um, so but Kenya, it's been, yeah, that's, Ken, that's yeah. great. Kenya, so, so do you have a question or comment? Yeah. Yeah. So when you're helping to like build and formulate those brand wholesaler relationships, like what's good for the brand and like what's good for the wholesaler and like what do they look for on both ends of the spectrum? Kenya, I love this question. Um, and the answer to this has actually changed during the pandemic. It's totally shifted. So there's been a couple of changes from a retailer's perspective of what we now expect from brands and brands need to shift to make sure they can keep up, get new accounts and keep up with their existing accounts. So one of the things retailers, we shifted to smaller, smarter, more frequent buying decisions. Um, that's because we have PTSD from getting stuck with a ton of things in the pandemic. We're still not sure what consumers want. Um, you know, the, we reopened as a nation this past uh, summer. And so it was like, all right, the joy of gathering is the big economic trend. People are going to buy dresses and things to gather and um, plates for gathering people. But now then a new variant came. And so we're buying smaller um, orders. So brands need to drop their minimum opening order like to very low because they just need to get their foot in the door. And we'll probably reorder from them again in a couple of weeks, but they can no longer do an opening order of $2,000. I'm really saying, 150 to 300. Just get your foot in the door, let things sell, and, and we'll reorder. Katie, um, another, do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm wondering because uh, based on everything you're saying, um, it was a, maybe six months ago, I listened to Amazon interview and in, 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 on NPR, and the numbers were ridiculous where they took their gross and the marketing fees, which were millions, weren't even contributed into the overall fees. So um, and then they showed the percentile of brick and mortar companies like yours, where it was an X amount of percent low. And then it went up to like, I don't know, maybe 33%, like super high. So I'm wondering, are you as a brick and mortar, are you on Amazon is a question I have. Yes or no? I love this question. And an even bigger overarching question people like to ask me too is, do you feel threatened by Amazon? And I try to keep my eyes on my own paper. And I tell uh, my other retailer buddies and brands to keep your eyes on your own paper, which is actually listening to your customers. Um, I can't compete with Amazon on price. We can kind of keep up with them on shipping. My shipping team's amazing. We are not, none of our products are on Amazon. We don't sell products that are on Amazon, but I can beat Amazon every time on in-store customer experience, online customer service experience. We don't have a chat box or anything like that. And so that's the way we are going to continue to compete in the future is offering, like Elizabeth was saying, when she travels, she wants to go into these stores. We know our customers, when their dog dies, we send them a gift. Um, when they have a baby, we send them a gift. We are very um, in tune with our customers and Amazon can never take that away from me. So we'll just continue to pivot and- yeah. um, Yep, ride that wave of also people caring about who's behind their purchases. Love that, right. yeah. And I guess the other short thing was, um, cause I heard like, oh, if you don't use their shipping warehouse that they put you instead of front on the page, they'll, you know, they'll bury you. So then you're not even seen if you don't use their shipping warehouse. Mm. But so with big brands like Amazon, they're gonna constantly make changes, right? And so it is what it is, but that is why I'm very passionate about working with brand owners to let them know the other options that are out there because they'll hear from a lot of their friends that you need to get on Amazon. That's the only way. And they'll look at the percentages. Um, but I am very big on saying, hey, let's think about wholesale. In fact, this is interesting. This was announced yesterday, FAIR, F-A-I-R-E.com. Um, they are like the nation's and world's biggest wholesale platform. They announced yesterday their Series G fundraising and it totaled $400 million, now valuing them at $12.4 billion. And that showed me that industry insiders, they see the future of retailers the future of retail through actual independent brick and mortar stores because fair sells to independent brick and mortar stores. So I'm always looking at investments 
as what is what will shift in the future. Um, because a lot of brands are hitting a ceiling in customers through their direct to consumers. They're getting on Amazon. Amazon can change things. There's other outlets they're pursuing where they lose a lot of control. And so I love seeing this Series G investment analysis because it tells me again that those insiders are saying brick and mortar is here to stay. We're investing in it and we'll actually think it will increase. That focus has been on e-commerce, but I think it's coming back to brick and mortar. Excellent. Well, I'm sorry, but we are running out of time for this. But really, this sounds like a wonderful store. I may just visit your where where is it in North Carolina? Is it in Raleigh? Did you say in Raleigh, North Carolina? If you guys are online shops, amazing. Visit the flourishmarket.com. It's 295 flat rate shipping. Do all your holiday shipping through us. You can we'll handwrite the note you leave at checkout. We represent over 200 brands, all of which drive positive change. Your purchasing power is real. Uh, please visit us online. Excellent. What a great way to wrap up this segment. So, Absolutely. Listeners, you are listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on WOR 710, the voice of New York. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back, listeners. You are listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710 with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our show has just been incredible so far. It's all about innovation oh if you missed anything, it's on our podcast tomorrow. It's on our YouTube channel. But we have one more incredible innovator left. I love this product. If you go to YouTube, you can see a picture of her with all her product behind her. This is Lynn Eichenbaum with Garden Sleeves. Can Tell us all about it, Lynn. Oh, I will. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Richard, for having me on. So my name is Lynn Eichenbaum. I came up with the glove sleeve combination called Garden Sleeves. So you can garden in the heat without having to change into a hot long sleeve shirt. Because face it, we don't change into long sleeves. We get hot when we garden outside. And there are so many people who are very, very sensitive on their arms, myself included. And especially women and men as they get older and their skin gets more brittle, when you're reaching into the plants, you're reaching into the desert grass or doing anything outside with regard to yard work, your arms are very susceptible to poison ivy, to scratches, to mosquito bites, dirt, the sun, stinging nettles, all of that. So I just wanted a glove sleeve combination so I wouldn't have to change into that hot long sleeve shirt. So my brainchild became the garden sleeve. And it's got, it's a 100% cotton sleeve attached to a nitrile dipped water resistant glove, which is incredibly durable, really, really good for picking thistle and uh, other, you know, pokey pointy things. It's got a very comfortable elastic band that secures it over your bicep. And I'll tell you, my, uh, my <laughs> days became very, very filled as I became a self sort of a self-made seamstress. My kids were really into competitive Irish dancing when they were younger, you know, with the wigs and the big dresses. And our dance school actually needed a seamstress. And I'm a very type A personality. I had never sewn anything before, but I said, okay, you know what? I'm gonna teach myself how to sew. So I volunteered. I bought an expensive sewing machine. I did YouTube videos, taught myself how to sew. And the first day I pulled apart one of those $2,000 Irish dance dresses, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what is wow. happening? What am I going to do? <laughs> and, uh, you know, through a lot of trial and error, I sort of became, again, a self-taught seamstress. And it was easier for me then to come up with a prototype because I didn't have to outsource it to a company or research a company overseas or, you know, down south to make the prototype for me. I was able to do that for myself and I loved it. So I made the prototype and I gardened with it and it protected my arms threw it right in the laundry when I was done and absolutely adored it. And I had done extensive research on Amazon on all sorts of gardening sites to see if anything like this existed. And the fact that it didn't, the only thing that was very close was a sleeve that was more industrial. It was a 13 gauge polyester Kevlar and it was very hot. It was not like Kevlar. <laughs> Kevlar. That'll Kevlar. keep the chicks out. <laughs> I know. Also dodge and, bullets too, yeah. right? Exactly, yeah, it's bulletproof. <laughs> so for the average gardener, it just wasn't conducive for something you would want to put on and wear outside because it was just too darn hot. Well, Lynn, so, you are the yeah. you you yeah. are the absolute consummate inventor, and yeah. I admire yeah. your resourcefulness 
in pulling all of this together, learning how to sew, ripping apart a $2,000 dress and coming up with this uh, product, you know? Well, I think what I like about it a lot is you have so many different fabric designs. You have them for men, you have them for women, but also like ticks are really big here and you have to, and you have well, light no, fabrics. Not, that are, there's a lot of them. They're not like really No, they're big. not big. I mean, <laughs> okay. So there are many ticks here. So that's one thing we really have to be careful about in our backyard. So this would definitely, the fact that it kind of seals with this elastic at the top, right. And onto the glove at the bottom would keep your, the ticks off of your arms while you're, like digging around in the woods in our backyard and stuff. So, but you, I love the designs that you have. So you have men's, women's, do you have them for kids yet? You, or is that next on your list? No, I do. So I have them for everybody. Uh, my website is mygardensleeves.com. I have mainly women. I have to be honest. I sell mostly, uh, I would say 10 to one women to men. So I offer to the women First and foremost, it's a size nine, which is one size fits most. I can customize the glove if there are women with larger hands or with smaller hands. Uh, for children, I usually actually use the end of my bolts with, uh, you know, if I have fabric left over, I'll whip up a couple kids' sleeves. And this is really a mom and pop. Uh, business venture right now, or should I say mom and mom? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I have five sewing machines in my house and we, I brought two friends on board with me and we are churning them out. Uh, I brought them to the Philadelphia Flower and Garden Show, which was held at FDR Park in Philly this past June. They had the foresight to move it from the convention center outdoors because of COVID. And I single-handedly sold 750 pairs in nine days. Wow. It was phenomenal, phenomenal. <laughs> you know, I have to say, you say it takes it takes a community. Well, the gardening community is incredibly tight knit, and we love to share success stories and failure stories. We love to show our scars and talk about how we got them. And I learned so much just from talking to master gardeners and other people. Going to shows for me is like a focus group. So are these in brick and mortar stores anywhere? Yeah, I do have them in a few brick and mortar stores in New Jersey. I'm also in a Blooming Hills Lavender Shop in Virginia. I just recently uh, was invited into Smith's Hardware down in Eunice, Louisiana, which is really exciting. So I'm wow. starting to spread, which is wonderful. So I'm starting to spread out across the country. And it was great because through networking, I actually found... Uh, the national, um, it's the National Lawn and Garden Show that I'm going to be going to. And they specialize in brick and mortars. They have to have at least five brick and mortars. Cool. And, uh, and then I present in front of them and they see if they're interested in carrying me. So we're really, really excited about this year. Well, yeah, because I just, just heard about this really cool store down in Raleigh. <laughs> I I'm like Lynn, every oh my God. garden store needs your product at, like these would go so fast for them I, you'd really be a great partner to them and help them be successful I have to say I was listening to what Emily was saying and I'm like this is a match made in heaven that happens a lot on passage to profit a lot of yeah, good so, matches so, so Katie, Katie what do you what are your thoughts <laughs> Yeah, I, I, congratulations. I think it's completely genius. It reminds me of like growing up with my granny Dale and just watching her in the garden growing up. Um, so my question is, um, um, can you put, you said mention, just throw them in the laundry. Can you put that rubber in the dryer? Yes, nitrile is fully machine. No, not in the dryer. Nitrile is fully machine washable. So the whole glove, the whole piece can come off. It goes right in the washer and you should hang them dry. On cold or hot, or does it matter? It doesn't really matter. I've okay. washed them in cold. I've washed them in hot. And the nice thing is if you happen to brush up against the poison ivy plant, urushiol is the oil that tends to get stuck on things. And if you don't wash off the urushiol, you'll get reinfected. So the nice thing about my gloves, about my garden sleeves, is that the whole thing can go in the wash. So if you happen to brush up against it, it gets washed off, and then the glove is clear. 
Wow, that's Beautiful. really great. So if you have a pair of green ones and I buy them, I can be green sleeves, right? Oh, Lord. Yes. And you so can have I've green I've heard that before. I know. Yeah. So, so Kenya, do you have any comments, Kenya? <laughs> yeah. So Lynn, how do you plan to scale the pr production from a mass perspective? Because you're literally a living sewing machine, but I know you can't. <laughs> As sales continue to grow, you're going to have to be able to keep up with orders. That is such a great question. So yeah, I am at a crossroads right now. So I'm looking at two options. The one option would be to have completely outsource and have them made either, I'd rather not have them made overseas. I'd rather find a manufacturer here in the States because that's very important to me. So having somebody do that, as opposed to me bringing 10 machine, you know, sewing machines in and having all the rest of the stay at home moms in Bellamy, New Jersey, come and do it out of my basement. Uh, the other option would be to license my patent. And that's always a possibility. If another manufacturer who's already established wants to license my patent, I would get a royalty and they would take care of the manufacturing, the uh, advertising, the marketing and all of that. So I'm looking at both options uh, in a couple months. If I come back, you know, to talk to you guys, there's a lot in the works right now. And my head is like, ready to explode because this whole business is just taking off. And I have to say, I go to bed exhausted every day. I have one I'm, more quick question for you. Do you have a patent attorney? I happen to know one. <laughs> I do actually. And this all goes back to Irish dance. My trademark attorney who trademarked the name Nompi, which is the name of my company. I'm the No More Poison Ivy Glove Company which is kind of funny. Uh, he actually w was the dad of an Irish dancer. Gotcha. So well, I know he, another one in case you. <laughs> okay, well, okay, like she's doing great. Katie um, has to say something here. Yeah, we should have another conversation because um, I know of a, a, a manufacturer company right here. So in America. So yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Yeah. So I, I mean, I just love this story because it's so entrepreneurial and, um, you know, you've, you've really taken it a, a, a long way. Don't let your head explode. Maybe you should, you could do a jump off of uh, uh, James's cliff to clear your head for a little bit. With the gloves, with the gloves. And with the gloves, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time for this segment. But um, so where can people buy these mygardensleeves.com and then my, yep, mygardensleeves.com, Elizabeth, and uh, I've got all the styles and everything on there. Okay. And they make an excellent gift. So listeners, you are listening to Passage to Profit. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> With Richard Elizabeth Gerhardt. If you missed any of our show, I mean, this has been a truly show full of innovations and new ways of doing things. It's been amazing. You can hear it on our podcast, which is be out tomorrow on all the major podcast sites or go to our YouTube channel. And then you can see Lynn's garden sleeves hanging up behind her. So anyway, we'll be right back after this message. You're listening to WOR 710. This is Passage to Profit, and that we've just had an outstanding show, haven't well, we? Well, we, we tried to purposely this year move the show to innovation, and I think this has been an incredibly innovative show. I mean, I, I, I feel here, completely innovated. I, I, the pe I feel inspired yeah, and, myself. Yeah, and so and many different ways. So we had Katie Chinakis, who is a performer and has just done a number of things, but is also on the cutting edge of technology with things like NFT and how artists get paid and really kind of a movement to change the world a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And she's really smart too. And I think um, you, you heard that on the show, lots of times entertainers get a bad rap for that. And um, that is not her case at all. And then Kenya Gibson did her power move. So Kenya Gibson, with a P at iHeartMedia.com, Kenya Gibson, iHeartMedia.com. She was actually the brains uh, that created this show. It was her idea. And she... what, 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 what made her do that? We'll never know. But... <laughs> <laughs> what made her ask us to do it? We'll never know. But anyway, um, so if you have any marketing or branding needs or want to get on the radio or do advertising, talk to Kenya. Yeah, Gerhardt Law uses iHeart Digital Services. We've been using them for three years and they're great. So um, if you're in the market for that, definitely check out uh, iHeart. And then we had James Jensen with LimitlessFlight.com jump. So 
if you have fears, if you want to play with your psyche, if you want to really conquer these fears, look for limitlessflight.com. It's coming out next year and it's just going to be an incredible experience for everybody. It's, it's, it's the wave of the future. I can hardly wait. Yeah. Fall for miles without actually crashing. <laughs> without actually falling. Without actually but you feel falling. like you, it's just very cool. And then Emily Gray, Flourish Market, www.theflourishmarket.com. She is helping small inventors with consumer products get their products in front of people through her website and her brick and mortar store. Really cool stuff. From all over the world and bringing social purpose to uh, commercialism. And then if you're a gardener or know a gardener, Lynn Eichenbaum with Garden Sleeves by Nompi, and you can find them at mygardensleeves.com. These are so cool. These are sleeves with rubber gloves at the end that you go all the way up almost to your shoulder, and you can go out in the garden, you can get poison ivy on them, and you can wash them. And it's all gone. And it's all gone. So with Christmas coming up, you couldn't put sleeves in your stockings. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> with that, with that, um, Katie, do you have any final words for our audience before we leave? Yeah, um, I just from everything that's been going on, just, um, you know, I hope this has made a great impact to inspire you. I'm inspired in um, multiple ways. And just remember to play and be curious and, you know, make a great impact. And we can do that by having a lot of fun playing and being curious and sharing stories like this and connecting and getting past our emotions. If we think it's going to be dumb, or if we think it's going to not work out, just who cares if it's not, if we think it's not going to work out, we know that just do it anyway. Just let's break past those old barriers and old emotions and those thoughts that come up and show up to be a part of something that's more than just us yeah. as a collective. Really nice. Kenya, what are your thoughts? So I'm just sitting back and thinking about like all the elements from this conversation today. And if I had to narrow it down to three things, I would say innovation, fear, and freedom, right? All the things that make a great entrepreneur and make a great creator. And I just loved hearing your story, Katie. You know, I love what Emily's doing for brands in the wholesale space. And Lynn, I think you're so creative and innovative in terms of what you're doing to solve the problems of gardeners and you can jump with James, right? So get over your fears and limitations. So again, great conversation, uh, great way to just kind of bring everything together in full circle for all the creators and the entrepreneurs out there. Thank you so much, Kenya. That was uh, uh, truly well said. So. We have to sign off now, everyone. But before we do, we'd like to thank you for listening. We love our audience. And we also like to mention that we'll be back next week with another episode of Passage to Profit. We'd also like to thank our uh, team, Noah Fleischman, our producer, uh, Alicia Morrissey, our program coordinator, Chatterboss, our video editor, and the whole iHeart team. So this is Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt for Passage to Profit on iHeart Radio. W-O-R-710, the voice of New York. Yeah. Shout out to iHeart. Yay. Yeah.